All right, hi everyone. It's just about 12 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the first community education webinar from VOICE for 2021, Self-Care for Caregivers. Uh, we're excited to start on this series and um, to hear from Tara today. First, a couple of details to go through with you. We'd like to thank our amazing sponsors. Um, special thanks to the FDC Foundation for continuing to support VOICES education programming, as well as Amon, Gantner, and Capriano, Everspring Pharmacy, Oasis Senior Advisors, Parasol Alliance, Quinn Estate and Elder Law, and Transitions for Senior Living. Thank you guys all so much um, for being supporters of our education. Um, if you forgot to opt into the sponsor prize drawing, we will offer several of those throughout the series this year. Go ahead and email your name to events at voicestl.org to be entered to win that prize drawing. Um, we will be sharing your in contact information with our sponsors, just an FYI. Um, you can also email events at voicestl.org if your organization is interested in becoming a sponsor for the, se the series this year. And um, we would love to keep this community education free to long-term care family members and community members at large. Um, to do that, put on these events, it costs about $50 per person for voice. And if you'd like to help us keep this education free, you can visit this link here and um, drop a donation. And we thank you so much. We do have some upcoming webinars. These are the community education series. I'm sorry for the uh, mistitling there um, for the rest of the year in June resources for residents and families. And then July, August and September, some finance and legal planning webinars available followed in October by cannabis and CBD for older adults and long-term care residents. And finally in November, um, protecting your hard earned assets, what you need to know to stay financially secure. And you can register for all of those at the link below. Um, at the end of this webinar, we will be opening a poll survey. And if you could fill that out and help us provide the education that um, you all are looking for, we would be very appreciative of that. Um, a couple other notes, the Q&A box below is open. If you have any questions throughout this presentation, please feel free to throw your questions in that box and we will have some time for Q&A at the end. And finally, I'm excited to present Tara Stevens from Behavioral Health Response. Tara is a licensed professional counselor and certified clinical trauma professional. She works for Behavioral Health Response as the community engagement liaison, providing crisis intervention in Missouri's Eastern region. She is an international speaker specializing in trauma, emotional regulation, suicide awareness and prevention, and first responder wellness. And Tara, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited um, to be here today, and I'm so excited to have so many people um, on the line right now watching, because this is one of my absolute favorite presentations to um, talk about because I really feel like it has a lot of great information of things that we can do to overall improve our mental health, but also our physical health. So, because it's all connected, right? Our brain's attached to our body. Um, especially during right now with a lot of extra stressors going on, it's really important that we take that time um, and focus in on ourselves. So, um, like Megan said, I work at BHR Behavioral Health Response. If you haven't heard of us, I'm going to go ahead and give you my little spiel on who we are um, and why you should know about us. So BHR is the 24-7 crisis line. So if you can take a picture of that number or jot it down, it's always great just to have this number in our back pocket, right? Because we never know when we might need to use it. So it is the crisis line, but I always say there's no wrong reason to call us. You do not have to be in a crisis to call us. Okay, a lot of our calls are with individuals who are thinking about suicide, um, but we also get a calls for a number of reasons. Maybe you're looking for counseling services, substance use treatment. Um, you can call us. We have a huge database and we can provide those kind of referrals. Um, I've had people who call us because they're concerned about a family member or a friend. Their behavior has changed. Um, maybe now they're kind of wanting to isolate 
separate themselves. They're not communicating um, with you as they would normally would, or you notice um, they're maybe a little bit more paranoid or they're stopping, they're not showering anymore, or they're talking about suicide. You can always call us and we can talk about what are some options. What, how can we provide that support for that individual? I give this card out to everyone I know, like me in the community. And one lady, was a um, social service provider. She gave this card out to other people, but she told me that one time she had to use it, right? She was driving down 70 and she had a panic attack and she called us and we were able to use some like brain tricks, refocus the brain, calm down the brain and the body, right? So this number is good for a variety of reasons and feel free to call us. We're available 24 seven. It's completely free. Um, we don't care about your insurance. The only reason we would need to know that is if we're making referrals to outside organizations, right? And I have talked to people who are two and 98. So it's all ages. It's all social and economic classes because when we need mental health support, it doesn't matter if we have a billion dollars or if we have $2, right? We need that support. And um, BHR likes to see itself as the safety net of the Eastern region of Missouri. So we cover 10 different counties, um, including St. Louis City, St. Louis County, St. Charles, Lincoln, Warren, Franklin, Jefferson, St. Francis, Iron, and Washington counties. If you are outside of any of those counties, you can still call us and we will refer you to the appropriate crisis line, okay? So we provide that 24 seven um, crisis intervention over the phone. We also do mobile outreach so we can come out into the community and see someone face to face. That looks a little bit different right now during the pandemic. We're doing that more like a telehealth like a Zoom, um, but taking that case by case. So depending on if we do feel it would be beneficial to actually see someone face to face, that's a conversation we can have. Uh, we also provide follow-up services. So if you call us and we see that you're kind of maybe more high risk, maybe you've thought about suicide in the last two months, you need additional support services in place, then we will, you'll go into our follow-up. Or if we do mobile outreach, then you'll go into our follow-up. And our follow-up clinicians are amazing at what they do. They call within 24, 48 hours from our initial um, interaction. And then they will call up weekly, more or less depending on their need, your need until you are connected to services, right? So we don't wanna just have you talk to somebody over the phone for like 20 minutes, get some numbers and say, good luck. We wanna make sure that we follow through and you're actually getting linked to those support services. So if that means doing three-way phone calls with your insurance, we can do that. Um, our follow-up clinicians also know where there's wait lists at places, um, what different agencies take different types of insurance or do sliding scale or um, no pay. So they're really great at kind of connecting individuals to the appropriate care. Okay, so feel free to call us, no wrong reason. If you just need to talk, if you just need to vent because you're under a lot of stress, that's fine too. You can call us, right? We, sometimes we all just need to talk to somebody who is not related to us, who has no kind of um, biases or judgment about based on what we're gonna say, who's just going to listen and support us. And that's what we do at PHR. Okay, these are master level clinicians as well. So it's not volunteers. These are people um, who have a degree in counseling or social work. All right, so um, if you read the little kind of um, summary of what this presentation was gonna be about, it's about putting on your oxygen mask first, right? If you've ever flown in an airplane, this is talked over and over and over again um, during the little intro when you're on the plane by the flight attendants, that if there was cabin pressure loss, that the oxygen mask would come down, make sure you secure yours before you help anyone around you, right? Because I mean, if we don't take care of ourselves, we're not going to be able to help anyone around us, right? As helpers, as individuals that are taking care of family members, of friends, of loved ones, we have to make sure that we are able to do that both mentally and physically, right? And so we have to make sure that we take care of ourselves and we put that oxygen mask on ourselves first. And that's hard. That's hard as somebody who likes to take care of other people right? At me as a counselor um, and my colleagues, like that's what our job is, right? Is to take care of other people. And we really have to make it a priority that we are no good to anyone else unless we're taking care of ourselves. Okay. So I'm sure you've heard a lot about coping skills, a lot about self-care and those things are so, so important. And we're going to talk about why um, practicing those coping skills and self-care is so important, but that's really not what this presentation is about. So 
if that's what you're coming for, um, we can definitely talk a little bit about that, but that's not the whole goal of this presentation. The goal of this presentation is about lifestyle changes. What are some things that you can do, just little things on the daily that overall are going to improve your mental and physical health? What are things that are going to decrease the stress in your body. I like to call the stress like the stress cocktail because it has all these different stress hormones that are pumping through our body and impacting it, right? Those stress hormones are can lead to long-term negative mental and physical health outcomes. But if we make little lifestyle changes, we can actually improve the overall health, our mental and physical health. Okay, so that's what we're really gonna focus in on today. I always like to start my presentations by practicing a mindfulness tool because mindfulness is hands down the best way to decrease stress in our body and in our brain. Mindfulness. So if you have never practiced mindfulness, you don't know what it is, you need to write it down and you need to research it after this presentation. Okay. There are tons of amazing mindfulness exercises out there. If you just like Google it, you'll find a bunch, right? You can go into YouTube and they'll actually have videos. If you want more of like my mindfulness tools, you can actually go to uh, BHR's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube channel, and find a bunch of different mindfulness tools and techniques. The month of May, we're actually making like mindfulness May, and we're going to have a different mindfulness tool every day. So on our Facebook and Instagram. So check out our social media. There's my little plug for that. So we stay connected. So mindfulness, what we know when we practice it for five minutes a day, just five minutes for three months, we know it heals the brain. It heals the brain from stress and trauma. We're going to talk about today how stress and trauma change the brain, how it impacts the brain and the body, but we know mindfulness can heal it. Okay. Just five minutes a day, super easy. You don't even have to do it all at once. You can do 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there, but make sure you're making this a, just a daily kind of routine. If you wake up every morning, if you have to do this throughout the day and the evening, practice some mindfulness. And we're going to do one today together. So if you can just, if you can sit somewhere, um, maybe your back straight, feet on the floor, maybe you're lying down, whatever's comfortable. I want you to go ahead and put your palms up on your knees. So make your arms open. And this mindfulness technique is going to be using some deep breathing. And when we do deep breathing, we really want to do what we call belly breathing. We don't want it superficial up here in our chest. We want it deep down in our diaphragm. And when we do these deep breathing exercises, we want to breathe in through our nose and we want to breathe out through our mouth. Okay. So in through our nose, out through our mouth. And when we do this, we're gonna try to visualize some words, okay? So you can either close your eyes or look around and kind of find a calming like spot you can focus in on. And I want you to breathe in through your nose and I want you to picture the word just, J-U-S-T. Try to see those letters, J-U-S-T. And when you breathe out through your mouth, picture the word this, T-H-I-S. Okay, so close your eyes, look down, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth. Focus on that deep belly breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. In through your nose and out through your mouth. Now picture the word just and this just this just this just this Couple more times on your own. Slowly open your eyes or look up. 
hopefully you're feeling calm. And when I do this presentation in schools with students, I often hear students say, I feel like I'm ready to go to sleep. And that's the goal, right? It's supposed to calm down our brain and our body. Mindfulness is all about being in the present moment. Okay, so if there's 24 hours in a day, most people sleep about six, that leaves 18 hours a day that we're awake. Out of those 18 hours, we are actually only in the present moment about seven hours. That leaves 11 hours of the day we're thinking about other things. So maybe we're reliving a conversation that we had um, with our spouse right? Or we're stressing out about bills we have to pay or dinner we have to make, right? So we are not in the present moment, but we are worried about the past or stressed about the future. And that's only increasing those stress hormones, that stress cocktail on our body. So mindfulness is just about being here. If you're here with me right now, hopefully this isn't too stressful, right? Just listening to me talk and looking at the screen is not too stressful. But if you are actually reliving a conversation, an argument you may have had with your parent or with your spouse or with your boss. You're thinking about those things, right? You're not here in this moment. So mindfulness, we could do anytime. We can practice this while we're washing dishes. We can practice this while we're making a bed or going for a walk. We don't need to like, um, just say this is our only time we're gonna practice mindfulness, right? We can do it little bits here and there. Anytime we use our senses to engage and be present, we are practicing mindfulness. So that's just one tool, the just this. That's just one tool that you can utilize. I'm gonna talk about another one in a little bit um, at the end of the presentation, but just know there's a ton out there and you don't need even like a tool. You can just practice mindfulness while you're washing dishes. Just be in that present moment, okay? So now that we're relaxed, let's talk about stress. We all have stress. We all have stress because we're human. We have responsibilities all the time. We have responsibilities with our family. We have responsibilities like bills we have to pay. We have to-do list. You probably have a to-do list right now, right? So our, we all have stress because we're humans. And here's the thing about stress. Some of it's actually good for us. A little bit of stress is good for us. It's called eustasis and motivates us. So for me, I'm a procrastinator. I'm a procrastinator at heart. If I know I have a presentation that I have to do, I'm going to finish that presentation 15 minutes before I present it because that's when I do my best work. Megan was asking for this presentation and I'm like, oh, there's some tweaks I need to do to it. Um, so I just, I sent it to her like 45 minutes before it was supposed to start today, right? Because that is when I that get that pressure that I perform well. We need a little bit of stress to release some cortisol. Not cortisol is that stress hormone. A little bit of it's good. It actually helps us move our body. If we didn't have cortisol, we couldn't like physically move our body. The problem is we don't just have a little bit of stress. Um, we have a lot of other things that are going on, right? And they add on top of each other. So that little bit of cortisol that's good for us, in the long term, we're going to add more cortisol to it and it's not going to be so great, right? So if I have a little bit of stress, I like to show it on this window stress tolerance because it's just a good visual. So you see that bar chart? Uh, a little bit is good. The problem is all those other things add to it, right? So I have a two and a half year old and a six month old just hands down, I'm going to probably going to start off with a little bit more stress, right? Because they keep me on my toes. And with the pandemic, I'm trying to work from home with those two little babies. I love them. They're not, they're not bad, but it's, I can't completely focus on my work, right? Because they just demand a lot of attention and time. But last week I woke up and they were actually going to go to their sitters. And the sitter called me and said her kids were sick. So automatically, you know, I wake up in the morning with a little bit of stress. That's good but then I get that blow. So it adds more stress. I go out to my car to start my car and it won't start. So again, more stress. I open the hood and squirrels had built a nest in my car and eaten all my wires, more stress. I call the insurance company. I'm on hold for 10 minutes and then they just dis disconnect me, more stress. Do you see how it builds on top of each other? And eventually that bar graph is gonna be full 
Like I'm not going to be able to take any more in the day. And when that happens, it's called dysregulation. Now I'm dysregulated and now I'm making decisions based on my feelings. So if that bar chart is full, because all these things have happened that really kind of made me angry throughout the day, I'm going to respond in anger. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be upset. Those are kind of the days where I just feel like I need to go back to bed and start them over again, right? Just put me in a padded room. Like things are not going my way today. I know we all have those days, right? We are all become dysregulated at times because we're human. It just happens. We have feelings. Things happen to us that make us upset and make us sad, that make us scared. And it adds up and eventually we become dysregulated. So this can happen once a day, multiple times a day. This could happen once a week, once a month. Maybe you fill up this bar graph with just an individual that you work with on a common basis, right? Someone that you just maybe interact with that you already come into that conversation with them with a level that's way up here. So we all have those people we, that we interact with. We all have those days where it's just too much. It overwhelms us, fills up that bar chart, and we become dysregulated. I want you to know that this is normal. This is predictable. How our body and our brain respond when this bar chart is full is normal and predictable. It's how we're wired. So we're going to talk about what those body signs are, what's going on in our brain, those things are normal. It's normal when you are really stressed out to have an upset belly. It is normal for your heart to beat really fast. It's normal to have those migraines and headaches. It doesn't feel good. And that's why we need to practice those coping skills and we need to make these lifestyle changes, but it's normal. I want you to think about the brain the same way we would think about a computer that gets a virus. It's going to slow down that brain, just like that virus is going to slow down that computer till eventually it freezes, it glitches, and it stops working. It shuts down. So when we experience so much stress or this like overwhelming emotion of being sad or angry or scared, it's going to shut down that brain and that brain is not going to work properly anymore. So let's talk a little bit about that. So I am not a neurologist, so this is very basic, but I think it's important that we understand what's going on in our brain when we experience stress, because it's going to impact our whole body. And this is where we want to intervene. This is where we're going to want to practice some lifestyle changes, some coping skills to improve our overall health and our brain health, as well as our physical health. So when we are growing in utero, we grow from the bottom of our spine up. I like to use the visual of my arm because it's just easier for me to kind of I'm a talker with my arms and you guys are on zoom and I'm not in person. So I need to, I need to show you some visuals. So we grow from the bottom of our spine upwards, Let's pretend my arms and my spine and my hands, my brain. The first part of our brain to grow is called our cerebellum. It sits right on top of our brain stem. And this part of our brain is like autopilot. This is the part of our brain that's our survival brain. It just does things that we need to do to survive things. We don't have to consciously think about. So it's in charge of our digestive tract, our respiratory system, our cardiovascular system, our nervous system, all those things I don't have to think about. I don't think about my brain, um, my heart beating. I don't have to think about my intestines, like grabbing nutrients from my food, right? It just happens. This part of our brain, the cerebellum is fully developed when we're born. So we come out, we're breathing, we're crying, we're eating, we're pooping. Those systems are working, right? The next part of our brain to grow is called our limbic brain. It's a little part of our brain right back in the back that sits on top of our cerebellum. This part of our brain is where our emotions are. So if I'm really, really angry, it's right there. If I'm really, really sad, right there, right? Really scared happening all in that limbic brain. This is also where my memories are and where my senses are. So if you've ever smelled like a certain cologne or perfume and that sense comes in and it instantly attaches to a memory, you instantly think about maybe um, an ex-partner, someone you used to date or a friend or a loved one. So you get this instant picture of that person, right? You remember, remember that person and then it's attached to a feeling. So maybe it's like, oh, this perfume reminds me of my really good friend in college. Oh, that's a really like nice feeling. Or this cologne reminds me of an ex-partner that I really despised and hate. And I have like this negative feeling, right? Because it all happens there in that limbic brain. It's all super connected. 
This is also where our habits are processed. And this is why it is so important that we make coping skills or habits. So if your coping skill when you're really stressed out is to go for a walk, is to journal, is to sing, is to break out in a dance, is to go swimming, is to uh, pet your dog, whatever it is, if we make that a habit, right, it will help in the long term when our brain shuts down and we're in that limbic brain, when we're in that feeling brain, that habit will take over and calm our brain and our body down. Okay, so this limbic brain, most scientists agree that it's fully developed by the age of three. The last part of our brain to grow is our neocortex. And our neocortex is that thinking brain, that human brain. It's that bumpy part of our brain. So when you've seen pictures of a brain, it kind of looks like spaghetti or a bunch of worms or chewed up gum, right? It has all those grooves in it because we've learned things. Every time we learn something, neurons are firing, they're creating those deep grooves. If you looked at animal brains, you'd see that they have a neocortex, but theirs are smooth. They're not bumpy like ours. That's why we know what separates us from the animals happens in that neocortex. That's why we call it that human brain. So this neocortex isn't responsible for language. So I'm using my neocortex right now to choose words that I'm saying to you, and you're using your neocortex to understand the words I'm saying, right? Animals can communicate, obviously, but they can't use language the same that we can. I think we can all agree to that. It's also this part of our brain that we use for complex thought. So uh, thinking about the future, making a plan on how we're going to reach some goal, driving a car, all of those things are used in that neocortex. I like to tell um, students when I'm in schools that this is the part of our brain we need when we're at school, right? This is the part of our brain that we need to pay attention, to follow directions, um, to play with our friends, to read books, to do math problems. This is our rational, logical part of our brain. It's also our moral brain. So this is where we know to determine what is right and what is wrong. So if I have had that day where all these horrible things happen to me, right, and I am feeling lots of anger because now my car is not working and I have my kids and I have to work and all of these things are happening. And my husband says something snarky to me, right? This is the part of my brain that will chime in and tell me, you know, don't snap back at him. You love him. And that's not the nice thing to do. Right. But if all these crappy things have happened and I have become dysregulated, that bar chart is full. I can take no more then that neocortex stops working. It shuts down. Now, since we're humans, our brain realizes that some part of our brain is going to have to start making decisions. So the limbic brain takes over. The limbic brain is not a bad brain, but it's not that rational, logical, moral part of our brain. It's that feeling brain, right? So if my husband says something snarky and I'm dysregulated in my limbic brain, I'm going to respond based on the anger because of all those crappy things that have happened that day. And I'm going to smack, like snap at him, right? I'm not going to slap him, but I'm going to snap at him, right? I'm going to be, um, have, I'm going to have no patience, right? I'm going to just want to retaliate kind of sort of thing towards him. Does that make sense? So long-term that's going to probably have some negative um, consequences. Um, but in that moment, I'm not thinking about morality. I'm not thinking what's right or wrong. I am just responding based on my anger. So if things have happened all day today that have made me really scared, right? And something happens and I'm in my limbic brain, I may respond based on being scared. I may want to go hide. I may want to go in my room and shut the door. I may want to run away, right? I'm going to respond based on that feeling, based on that emotion. Now, most of us typically, when we become dysregulated, we're getting really upset right? We're angry. And so we respond in that anger. So maybe we yell, we want to punch something, we want to break something. Um, we say things we later regret. It's because we're operating in this limbic brain, in this feeling brain. And we've had a really rough day. We've had a lot of crappy things happen that have piled on top of each other and we can't take anymore. We are not rational, logical, and moral anymore. We are in that limbic brain, in that feeling brain. And remember this happens to all of us. But here's the really cool thing about the brain and the body. 
it gives us signals. When that neocortex is shutting down, it sends signals to my adrenal gland, pituitary gland to release all these stress hormones throughout my body. And those stress hormones alert me that I am overwhelmed. I am dysregulated, right? It is preparing me for survival. So that's when my belly hurts. That's when my brain is on my um, heart beating really, really fast, or I'm having those headaches or migraines, or I'm shaking really, really bad, right? Those are signals to me that I am dysregulated and I'm going in my limbic brain. Now, if we practice those coping skills and they have become habits, I will know when my body is like this, that I need to practice my breathing. That habit will just take over. I will calm down my body, which will calm down my brain and I can get my whole brain working again. But if I don't self-correct, if I'm unable to calm my body and brain down, I can go further back into my brain, into that survival brain. And that's where that fight, flight, or freeze lives. So now I'm not making decisions based that are rational, logical, or moral. I'm not making decisions based on my feelings or my memories. I am strictly trying to survive. That's when I become hyper-focused on the threat, right? Maybe I freeze for a period of time and then I want to maybe hit or fight or I want to run away, right? I am just trying to survive. So our goal is never to get back in that survival mode, right? Our goal is to recognize when we have those stress hormones to calm down our body and get our whole brain working again. So let's talk a little bit about the body. So when we experience that stress hormone cocktail, that signal from our neocortex to re, uh, send to our uh, adrenal and pituitary gland to release those stress hormones, it's preparing us for survival, right? It's preparing us to fight or run away. And these are some of the symptoms that we may experience. This is not all of them, right? Everybody is different. When I first started doing this presentation, I would talk to people and people would tell me, oh my gosh, I get so hot, right? I get red, I get sweaty. I am just burning up. It's like I've ran a mile, right? Um, but, oh, that's how most people are, right? Until I did this presentation for a third grade class and a third grader told me that he turns ice cold. He turns like he's an ice, um, ice cube. That happens to some people. I did some research and that's a thing. Some people experience that when they're under a lot of stress and they're dysregulated. So everybody is different. I cannot tell you what's going to happen to your body. You have to pay attention to that. So for me, I know when I'm really stressed out, I shake really bad. Like if I'm really, really scared, I shake. Um, other times I know that I may experience pins and needles. I may experience numbness in my limbs for a period of time. I didn't know I was under a lot of stress. I didn't know what was going on with me because my limbs would constantly go numb. I started seeing a neurologist. I was getting MRIs, lumbar punctures, right? And they couldn't figure out what was going on. It was stress. This is why some people feel like they're having a heart attack and they go to the emergency department, right? It's stress. You might feel heart palpitations. Like it feels like it's skipping a beat. I get a choking sensation or I almost feel like th I'm having throat spasms. I will get migraines. I will get dizzy spells. Some of us want to eat everything. Some of us don't want to eat anything when we are experiencing that stress. And it's because we have released the stress hormone throughout our body and it slows down our digestive tract. So other sometimes it's slowing down. We don't want to eat. Other times it's slowing down and we want sugars and starches because it's just wants simple carbohydrates to digest. It doesn't want anything too complicated. Uh, that's going to take a whole lot of energy to digest. Right. So all of these are normal. I've heard that my ear, my ear burns, my left knee hurts. I have been living with my in-laws for the last few months um, and why that's such a blessing. And I'm so thankful. And it has not been bad at all by any means. It's still stressful, right? Because now I'm worrying about my kids making a big mess and um, making sure that my kids aren't disturbing my mother-in-law when she's working. So my right eye has been twitching for these past three months right? I can't get it to stop twitching, even though I'm trying to ra rationalize it so much in my head, it's, it's still happening in my body. So when these stress hormones go throughout our body, it's also releasing inflammation. Okay. Acute inflammation is good for us. If I get a cut on my hand, I can see that inflammation. It gets red, it gets inflamed, it gets hot. That's there to heal that cut, right? 
that's inflammation is how our body heals itself. The problem is when we experience a lot of stress, that bar chart is full, we become dysregulated. We get a dose of that inflammation in our body, but it doesn't have a physical wound to go to. So it just hangs out, just hangs it out in our tissue. You can get blood work and you can find that a dose hangs out for about 30 hours. So if you are someone who you recognize you're getting dysregulated all the time, things are happening. They're just overwhelming you all the time, right? You're getting dose after dose after dose of this stress cocktail, these stress hormones and inflammation. And we know that chronic inflammation is not good. It's not good. We all know that, right? Chronic inflammation is linked to a whole host of negative health outcomes, mental um, health concerns like depression, anxiety, autoimmune issues like MS and lupus, uh, Alzheimer's. It's linked to all of those things. So we want to make lifestyle changes to decrease the stress hormone cocktail, to decrease this inflammation in our body. We have to be conscious about what we're doing every day to decrease the stress in our body. Okay, we can't just wish it away. We have to actually make some lifestyle changes. So these are the things I'm gonna talk about. Now, um, it's not gonna work if you're just gonna be like, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna do all of these things. It's, just, it's you're setting yourself up for failure unless you're like, you're able to do that. And that's amazing. And I want that gift. Most of us have to make these slow changes for them to stick, right? They have to happen so many times. So they become a habit and they're just come part of our daily routine. But let's talk about some things that might work for you. These are different ways that we need to do to take care of our body, right? We got to sleep. We got to exercise. We got to eat. And let's talk about how it's related to that stress hormone to that inflammation in our body. We have to sleep seven to nine hours. That's what studies show right now. Seven to nine hours in a 24 hour period. When we sleep, we naturally regulate our body, calms that body down, right? It gets rid of that stress hormone in our body. That circadian rhythm, right? That's responsible for releasing that cortisol in the morning, that melatonin at night is directly linked to our immune functioning. So we have to make sleep a priority. One night of not getting enough sleep or getting too much sleep, and we're not trying to heal from an illness has actually been linked to developing a protein complex that's linked to Alzheimer's. Okay. So we have to make sleep a priority. And I think in our society, it's just kind of hard to do that because we value performance and doing things all the time, right? We have things we have to do for other people. And then for me, like I have kids, right? When my kids go to sleep, I'm like, oh my gosh, now I have Tara time, right? Now I'm going to stay up and I'm going to watch a movie or I'm going to do a hobby. Or I'm going to read a book, right? Really, I need to go to sleep. <laughs> I need to make sleep a priority, but it's so hard to find that time for yourself. And so you might be like, okay, well, everyone's asleep. So now it's my time and want to stay awake. I challenge you to get some seven to nine hours and 24 hour periods so and naps count. If you realize you're only getting five hours of sleep, just slowly add 15 minutes um, a week. So skip five hours and 15 minutes, do that for a week, and then try to add another 15 minutes, do five and a half hours a night. You don't, your body's going to be in shock if you just try to completely change it, right? We have to make these little, little lifestyle changes. If you are somebody who has a hard time falling asleep because your mind is racing, here's the thing about our brain. When we wake up, when we are just going about our day, I'm sorry if you can hear that airplane, I have my window open. Our brain instantly is always looking around to see where's the threat. What is the next thing I have to tackle, right? What's the next thing I'm going to have to do? What's that threat that's in front of me? So our brain is constantly on alert. We got to calm that brain down. And the way we do that is by creating a routine. So if you have a hard time just going to sleep because your mind's racing, create a routine. It lets your brain know that it is safe to kind of turn off. Right. We don't have to be focused on all the list that to do list we have to do, right? We can relax now. So maybe that routine is like an hour before bed. You stop looking at screens. You go and um, take a hot bath. You get yourself some chamomile tea. Maybe you journal. You read. You pray. You practice mindfulness. You meditate. Whatever it may be, kind of get into that routine so your brain knows it can turn off right? And relax. If you were have someone who's having a hard time staying asleep, um, because your mind's racing, when you wake up, 
you know, and you're thinking about that to-do list, it's always worse in the middle of the night. Am I right? Always worse. If you keep a journal beside the bed and write down whatever your brain is worrying about or thinking about, it's a brain trick. It lets your brain realize that is somewhere else and will be addressed later. So do that. When we wake up first thing in the morning, instead of hitting snooze 15 million times, we need to get up and we need to get sunlight through our eyes. So for me, I instantly get up. I open up the blinds. I make the bed, right? That signals to me my day is going. But when I'm opening up those blinds, I'm getting sunlight into the room, getting sunlight through my eyes. You don't want to stare at the sun. We just want some light through our eyes. That sunlight is going to stimulate the hypothalamus. And that hypothalamus is what's going to release that cortisol. Remember, that little bit of cortisol is good for us and helps us move our bodies. And it gets that circadian rhythm going. So that cortisol release in the morning, and then it's going to release that melatonin at night. So first thing, do that. Now, if you're someone who wakes up when it's dark, maybe um, whatever your schedule may be, you have to wake up before the sun comes out. Um, go ahead and get like a vitamin D lamp because that will be hugely beneficial. Turn that on when you wake up in the morning. It's going to get that light through your eyes. Don't stare at it directly, right? But going to get that light through your eyes and it's going to stimulate that hypothalamus and it's going to get that release. Okay, the next thing we need to do is exercise. Guys, I know, I know that exercise is for me, for me personally, I hate it. There might be some of you who love to exercise and that's like your self-care, that's your coping skill. And that's amazing. For a lot of us, we probably really strongly dislike it because it just hurts and it's a lot of energy and I'm breathing heavy, right? But here's the thing about stress. We cannot rationalize it. It is great if we have people to talk to. It is great if we have family, friends, a therapist we can talk to. That's gonna do so many great things to decrease stress, but we cannot just rationalize it. It's physical. Right? We have those stress hormones and inflammation in our body. We physically have to get it out. Have you ever seen somebody who's really stressed out and they're shaking, they're tapping, they're pacing, they're moving. They are trying to get that stress hormone out of their body, right? They're trying to get that cocktail out of their body. One way to do that is by exercise. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening, we can see huge benefits. What we know is when we practice exercise, when we make it a habit, it actually increases the size of our hippocampus. And our hippocampus is that timekeeper of our brain. It's the part of our brain that labels like this event happened five minutes ago. This event happened 20 years ago, right? And scientists have found something really interesting. We can actually correlate the size of the hippocampus related to your rate of developing PTSD. So the smaller your hippocampus, the higher your chance of developing PTSD, the larger, the less your chance of developing PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms. So when we actually exercise, we are increasing that hippocampus. So we are decreasing our risk of developing post-traumatic stress symptoms, which we can all experience just because of daily life traumas, stressors, events that have happened in the past, events that are, could happen in the future, things we even hear about that have happened to loved ones. So it's really important that we do exercise to try to increase this hippocampus size. Now, certain types of exercises, if we incorporate mindfulness, we're getting more bang for our buck. So if we incorporate mindfulness, we uh, like in Tai Chi or yoga, we know it actually slows the selling of our cells, right? It slows the aging of our cells. Right. So we see a huge benefit of when we do exercise with uh, mindfulness. So this is the lifestyle change where maybe you're just going to start by waking up every morning and doing some stretches. Go to bed every night, do some stretches before you go to lay in bed. So maybe slowly you're going to take a little walk, a five minute walk down the street and back. Maybe you are going to watch a uh, exercise YouTube video. My mother-in-law loves classical stretch on PBS. She records them every morning and does them because it's on at like five in the morning, right? Those are, those are great ways of moving our body and getting stress out of our body. So just slowly try to incorporate it however you can. Maybe you're going up and down the stairs one, one extra time of day right? Maybe you're focusing on just getting that little bit of exercise, that movement. For me, I've been working from home, 
right? I used to be up in front of people doing these presentations, walking back and forth, getting that stress cocktail out of my body. Now I'm sitting in a chair doing it, right? It's not the same. So I have to make conscious decisions where I know I'm going to get up and move my body um, every hour if I can. So if you have like a smartwatch, you're setting that alarm on your phone, setting it every hour, I'm just going to get up and I'm going to move. So I slowly try to incorporate it in myself, go for a walk, when we go outside and we're around nature, it decreases stress in our body. So seeing plants decrease it. If you have plants in your house, great. Or go outside and get some fresh air. Uh, the last thing, not the last thing, but another thing that we can do, the last thing on the slide, is we need to eat right. Right. We need to eat anti-inflammatory foods. Now, the best anti-inflammatory diet is um, like a plant-based diet. So eating fruits and veggies right? Basically, we want to look at our plate and we want to see some color. We don't want to look down and see that everything's tan, right? We want to see greens. Greens are great anti-inflammatory. See berries. Berries are the best to get inflammation out of your system. Best fruit or vegetable um, out of all the berries, blueberries. So if you want to slowly start adding some blueberries to your morning, like a handful of blueberries, you could do that, right? We want to look down and see a variety. Other really great anti-inflammatory foods, walnuts, almonds, wild Alaskan salmon, those are all great. Now, if you want some like recipes, if you want to look at a type of diet and discover some new recipes, the Mediterranean diet from like the island of Crete is awesome. Now, if you Google it, you'll actually see a food pyramid. And that, why I think this diet works so well is at the bottom of this pyramid, it's built on movement. So some exercise, but it is also built on eating with other people. When we eat with other people, we naturally regulate. So making that lifestyle change, eating with other people, sit down with your family and friends and eat it. Don't just be trying to rush in between things and shoveling it in your mouth, right? We also, we, the studies have shown, this is really fascinating to me. When we eat the same meal, but we eat it with other people versus eating it in front of a screen or like shoveling in our mouth really fast, we actually get more nutrients from eating when we're eating with other people. So same food, same diet, we're, our body is absorbing greater vitamins and minerals when we eat with other people. It's because we're practicing mindfulness when we're eating with other people. We're more mindful of what we're putting in our mouth, right? We're smelling it. We're tasting it. We're feeling the textures. We are practicing, we're using our senses. We're practicing mindfulness. That's why it's so great when we, like we say with other people, like, let's go grab brunch or let's go get happy hour, right? That's what we do as a society. Cause we know we like to do that when there's a big event, a family event, like everyone comes together and we have a meal together because our body likes that. We, it feels good, right? We naturally regulate, we feel calmer. So even just eating with other people, small lifestyle change you can make right? Slowing down, practicing that mindfulness while you eat is awesome. Other things to be, um, to acknowledge, we want to remove toxins from our environment. So inside a home is actually like hundred percent more toxic than outside. So if you can open up your windows right now in St. Charles County, it's great. I have my window open. I'm getting some fresh air in, right? I'm releasing some of those toxins from inside the home, making sure you have a great air filter or you're changing that out every three months, like you're supposed to, um, being aware of what chemicals you're using for like beauty care on your personal and your skin. So body soap, lotions, shampoos, conditioners, um, but also being aware of like what you're cleaning with, what toxins you're cleaning with. There's a bunch of different apps that you can download. You can actually scan products and will it will tell you, um, kind of rate it on how, uh, better or worse it is for you based on like a toxic rating. So you can kind of see that. So removing those things from our environment is super helpful as well. But I'm going to end this by restating what I stated in the beginning. Mindfulness is the best, best way to decrease stress in your body. And it rewires the brain. It heals the brain. It helps us stay in our neocortex, right? It helps us stay in that rational, logical, moral part of our body. So we practiced a breathing exercise in the beginning. I'm going to go ahead and leave you with another mindfulness technique. And it's a little bit different. Here's the thing about our brain. It bonds over the negativity. It bonds over the negative. That's why if you've had a really hard day and you talk to a friend and you're like, all oh, this crappy things happen to me, your friend may say, oh, well, this crappy thing happened to me. If that makes you feel any better, it never does 
right? But we naturally want to bond over that negative. And it's part of survival. That's how our brain's wired. We're focusing on that negative because that's that threat. And we want to um, make sure that we survive. So we're going to focus on that threat to kind of get rid of that threat so we continue to thrive and live, right? That's how our brain's wired. The problem is that just increases our stress. If I am focusing on all my negativity and then my friend is talking about their negative negativity, it's just going to increase that stress in our body. So the goal is to reprogram the brain. And we're going to do that with a mindfulness technique called the mustard seed. So if mustard seed really small, right? But if you plant it, you water it, you put it under sunlight, it's going to grow really big, just like that big tree I showed you in the beginning. So the goal is to focus on something small, something little. What's your mustard seed? Something you would easily overlook, but you have gratitude for, that you're thankful for. That small thing. I found um, I found these wonderful like blackout curtains and they were a game changer, right? I used to work all different random hours and I would have to sleep at random different times. And having those blackout curtains really, really helps. That's something that I could easily overlook. Right. It's not it, it's not that big a deal, but I was experiencing some gratitude towards it. So I'm going to focus in on that mustard seed and I'm going to be thankful for it and I'm going to share it with somebody else. Right. This is reprogramming the brain on what we share. We're going to share those happy, positive things. So we're not increasing that stress hormone. So this might be an activity that you want to do every morning, every night. What's your mustard seed? What's something that you are grateful for that day? When we are focused in on our gratitude, we're unable to focus in on our stress. So we're, we are not increasing that stress level. So I'm going to leave you with that. Focus. Think about your mustard seed. Focus in on it. That is my whole presentation today. I know I went a couple minutes over. Um, if you do have questions, put that in the Q&A. And you can always reach out to me if you have questions about anything, you're looking for additional resources, support, feel free to email me. There's my email right there. All right, Megan. Tara, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And especially this being Mental Health Awareness Month, I think um, this is very timely and a great presentation for right now. We do have one question in the chat or the Q&A box so far. And I wanna encourage anyone who has any question to go ahead and put it in there. We'll get to as many as we can. Um, this question, I'm going to phrase a little bit more broadly than our attendee did. Um, what would you say to someone who is caring for a family member or um, just living with other family members and that person's schedule or priorities is not aligning with things that you need to do to care for yourself? What would you tell that person as like, a step they can take when they are super busy caring for someone else and don't feel that they have, you know, the ability to implement any lifestyle changes. Well, that mindfulness, right? I said, practicing for five minutes a day, you don't have to do it all at once. So just even doing 10 seconds here, 20 seconds there, um, slowly it'll become easier. The more we practice, the more we do it. And like I said before, mindfulness, we can do anytime, anywhere. It's just about using your senses. So even if you're making a bed, just being in that moment, right? Just focusing in on folding that sheet. I know it sounds silly, but that is one way we're actually decreasing that stress because now we're not thinking about, oh, I have to do A, B, and C after this and increasing stress on my body, right? Washing dishes, just being there. When you're taking a shower, focus in on that water hitting you, right? And you're not thinking about, oh, I have this is on my to-do to list for today. So practicing mindfulness slowly will become easier. But the more we do it, the greater we're going to see overall benefits. So that was that's an easy one we can incorporate, I think, anytime, anywhere. Great, thanks. Um, and the other question in here, um, someone wanting to clarify if you can't get your full seven to nine hours of sleep at night, you can make up for that with naps during the day. Yes. So okay. it's in a 24 hour period. Now, oftentimes I go and um, to like schools and talk to youth and they're, most of them will tell me they get less than five hours of sleep, which I just don't even know how those growing brains like function and go to school doing that. But then they'll say, hey, don't worry, I make up for it on the weekends. And I think most of us have this like thing where I'm like, okay, I have this one day 
where I will have more time to sleep and I can make up for it. That's not possible. That doesn't work. So really focusing in, in that 24 hour period, maybe I could only sleep for five hours and then I was up for maybe four hours, but then I could take a 30 minute nap here. And then I could take a two hour nap later in the day, right? As long as it's in that 24 hour period, obviously we would love it if it was all in one period, one stretch of time. Um, but sometimes that's not true, right? Like I just had a baby. So, you know, I was sleeping when the baby was sleeping or trying to, right? And I was up every two hours and I'm still, we don't need to talk about that because it's going to increase my stress. But. <laughs> okay. And um, would you say that you get the same benefits as sleep as like sitting in quiet meditation or something like that? Does that get you the same kind of rest? No. So meditation and quiet time and mindfulness is great right? I'm not saying that's not great, but it's not the same as sleep. When we are sleeping, we're actually draining neurotoxins from our brain. So I know that sounds kind of weird. Um, and if you want to like really make sure that your brain is draining appropriately, laying on your left side is a great way to do that. Um, but we need that REM sleep, right? That rapid eye movement. That's why we call it REM. It's kind of the same if you've heard of EMDR therapy, eye movement, rapid desensitization, if I could say that word, um, that bilateral stimulation by like our eyes going back and forth is processing the stress in our body and it's releasing that stress. So that's why sleep is so important because when we are in that REM sleep, we're having the eye movement back and forth, that bilateral stimulation that's decreasing that stress level in our body. It's decreasing those stress. It's processing all those stressful things that have happened during the day and it's releasing those. So there's a way like, so mindfulness meditation is so beneficial, but really making sure we're getting that sleep so we can drain those neurotoxins um, and do that bilateral stimulation. So, so important to get that stress out of our body. Thank you. Great question. Um, and then my final question for you, um, just out of curiosity, you may or may not know this, um, has VHR seen any trends as we're coming out of the pandemic in um, the types of resources and help that family members are looking for? Yes, so a big trend we're seeing is more domestic violence calls. Um, which we know is bound to happen when families are all together and unable to leave each other, right? Like there's higher stress, there's higher tension. Um, and so we're seeing more violence, um, more aggression, more anger. And that's going to happen when that bar chart gets full, right? When we experience all these um, really overwhelming emotional things all day long, build up on top of each other, then we're just going to respond in that anger, in that stress. And we can take that out on people in our home. So we're seeing more domestic violence calls. We're also seeing a higher rate of substance use calls because individuals are trying to cope with it, mm -hmm. right? They're trying to cope with isolation, um, loss of employment, all of these stressed kids trying to uh, be educated at home, parents trying to work, or they're unemployed, they're dealing with financial stressors, right? There's all of the, this um, stress that's going on and it's overwhelming. And we sometimes just wanna break from it. This is normal, predictable response, right? We wanna break from that pain, from that emotional turmoil. And that's why people turn to substances. So this is normal. This is how like we're wired to handle something. However, it's not healthy long-term, right? So we need to make sure that we're implementing those um, coping skills, those calming strategies to kind of process what's going on um, instead of turning to substances. But yes, domestic violence, substance use, um, and those are calls that I feel like we're only going to increase uh, even after we slowly get out of this pandemic because now people will become dependent on substances. Um, so we're going to see that as well. Great questions. Great. Thank you. Um, well, that is all the questions we have for you today. And thank you so much again for that okay. fantastic presentation and those uh, mindfulness tools. I am going to just share our, those last couple slides again that we had um, just with the directions. If you did enjoy this presentation oops, um, and you would like to help us keep making this free for everyone so we can bring more 
uh, webinars like this one that here is the link to donate and we really greatly appreciate it. I'm going to open the poll here. Um, and this is a little survey that we have so that we can evaluate um, our ongoing education as we make additions and uh, change things up for this year. So if you guys don't mind just filling this out really quickly, it's just five questions and we really appreciate your feedback. Thanks so much, Tara. Thank you.